Thank you very much. There we go. And I got my chat window up. Brilliant. OK, so I've done this talk before, but as with um, all of the times I do these talks, um, every time I come to it, I'm like, why did I put that in the deck? Why is it in that order? And it ends up being a slightly different talk. So if you've seen it before, there might still be a few new things towards the end. Um, <clears throat> and we always talk about different things. So I am watching the chat window. The chances of me being able to spot all the questions is almost nil because I'll be talking. Uh, but, you know, please feel free to come on camera. Feel free to share your reactions. Um, feel free to put questions in the chat if you want to. And Ahmad, I'm sure that you'll you'll pick out any anything that you think is uh, worth me answering. All right. So this is one of my favourite talks. Um, this has many, many of the things, I, of the models and thinking tools that I most love in it. Um, it's mostly a talk about human psychology and how broken we are as human beings. A lot of the things I'm going to be talking about are models from Dave Snowden um, and from Simon Wardley. Dave particularly has this, this thing he talks about around how we do pattern matching as human beings. And he says we don't just uh, do best fit pattern matching and then fix on it. We do first fit pattern matching. We see patterns in the data around us, and that is how we make decisions by the patterns we first see. And it's a really pervasive way of, of thinking. I'm going to break down how it happens a little bit and I'm going to talk, give you some tools for spotting when it's likely to happen and when it's likely to not be helping you and uh, some strategies for working with it, some, some things you can pass on to other people as well. OK, so before I do anything else, I want you to experience that pattern matching. OK, so what do you see? Can anyone see the elephant? I can see a couple of people nods. Yep, you can see the elephant. This is actually a lava flow on Mars. So Mars used to have lava, uh, it no longer has lava, but the shapes of it is left behind. So it's not actually an elephant. It just happens to look like an elephant. Um, if you can't see the elephant in that one, how about that one? Uh, this is elephant rock in Iceland. So we are used to this idea that we, we can see patterns in things, particularly we see faces, we see animal faces. Um, this is actually called pareidolia, which is our tendency to see patterns in meaningless data, uh, random data, and uh, particularly faces is a part of that. Um, it's a kind of apophenia, which is our tendency to see patterns generally. OK, so they're both types of confirmation bias, OK, which is our tendency once we've seen something to latch onto it and to keep thinking about that pattern on our heads and to hold that pattern in our heads. So it's very hard to unsee the elephant once you've seen it. So apophenia and pallidolia are the, the kind of subsets of that. There are other types of bias. There's actual observer bias. You can look these up. Google effects, one of my favorites. It's our tendency to forget things that we know we can look up online. Um, illusion of control, insensitivity to sample size, emission bias, negativity bias. Oh, my goodness, there's so many of these. Now, when I first did this talk and I looked it up on Wikipedia, I counted them. There are 159 in the list of cognitive biases on Wikipedia. Right. Um, that's how broken our brains are. And that there are often more of them or less of them, depending on whether they find new ones, group them together, whatever. Right. So there are 159 when I counted these. Um, Dave Snowden actually says these aren't cognitive biases. These are cognitive heuristics. They're there because we have limited time, we have limited attention, we have limited memory. And so we have to take shortcuts to be able to progress. And most of the time, these shortcuts in our brains are actually helpful and they're heuristics. They're, they're little simple rules that help us move forward. But some of the time, these things are wrong. And that's a problem because then we start making decisions in the wrong way. And this is a, this is when our brains are broken. OK, <clears throat> so there's one particular way that our brains are super, super broken. We don't like uncertainty. We really hate uncertainty as human beings. And there's been some studies done to find out about uncertainty. So this is one of my favourites, right? So um, UCL, University College London, they got volunteers to play this game. And in the game, there are rocks 
and there are snakes hidden under the rocks. It's just a, a computer game, I guess. Um, and the idea is you have to learn how the snakes behave. So you turn over the rocks and if you get a rock with a snake underneath it, you get an electric shock. I don't know who plays these games. I hope they were well paid. All right. But they vary the probability of snakes under rocks and they also measure people's stress levels as they're playing the game. It turns out that the people who are most stressed, they're not the ones who don't get very many snakes because they're pretty happy. They, they don't get shocked so often, but they're not the ones who are getting a shock almost all the time. It's the ones who don't know whether they're going to get a shock or not. It's the ones who are at 50 percent. They were the most stressed. They also solved the game the most quickly. They had the most incentive to do so. Right. So it turns out they're less stressed knowing you're going to get shocked than just not being sure at all. And there's so many experiments have been done around this idea of uncertainty. And it over and over again, it shows that we are more comfortable when we have certainty, even if the certainty is a bad outcome. And we will often pretend we have certainty, pretend to ourselves, use our biases to pretend that we've got certainty because we're more comfortable that way. And this gives us a problem when we're dealing with highly uncertain situations. <clears throat> so why does this happen? All right. So this is a ladder of inference from Chris Argyris. So the idea is we observe the data around us. There's so much data we cannot possibly take it all in. Everything we're seeing, everything we're hearing, everything we're feeling, touching, sensing, smelling, right? Everything. So we filter that data based on what we think might be interesting. And there are some native, some, some stuff that we've got that helps us filter that data. We generate some assumptions based on that data. So we give it meaning. We go, OK, I assume this data that I'm seeing means this stuff um, and that it's correct. And we draw conclusions based on what we're seeing and what we've historically seen. And then we build our beliefs on that. The way we filter our data is based on our beliefs. So this is a reinforcing loop. And the more our beliefs are proved right, or we can think that they're proved right, the more we're likely to do to go around this loop and reinforce and reinforce and we get these cognitive bias effects. Only when our beliefs are wrong, obviously. But our beliefs are wrong an awful lot of the time. I actually had somebody who said, you know, I, I, I don't believe anything that's wrong. I'm not superstitious at all. And I offered to swap his wedding ring for an identical one plus a hundred pounds. And he, he wouldn't do that. He had beliefs attached to the ring. You know, even though he swore blind, he wasn't superstitious at all. He had emotions and beliefs attached to this bit of metal. So everybody has these beliefs. OK. So um, what do we tend to do when we have these beliefs? We're in business, we're in tech, we're doing things. We've got this desire for certainty. Stephen Bungay has this great book called Art of Action. He talks about this little triangle. He says there's a problem because we have these these uncertain situations. We have we, we started from some context. We made some plans based on this context. And we have some actions that we're going to carry out as a result of the plans. We don't know whether the actions are aligned with the plans. So we've got an alignment gap, right? People can do things that, oh, that's not what I meant you to do. OK, um, we want people to do and what they actually do. So then we've got an effects gap. The outcomes that result from the actions may not be what the people carry out the actions intended either. And they certainly may not be aligned with the plans. So we've got this effects gap. So it's a gap between what we expect the actions to achieve and what they actually end up doing. And then because we weren't the persons carrying out the actions, we're managers, we're leaders, and other people go and carry out these actions, we don't actually know what the outcomes really were. So we've got this knowledge gap about the status and the, the context we're in. And the context that results is the context from which we make our next plans. So we there's a gap between what we do know and what we would actually like to know. And what we tend to do <clears throat> when we find these gaps is we try and fill them because we hate uncertainty. So we fill the alignment gap by issuing more instructions, detailed instructions, right? We micromanage at its worst. Uh, we fill the effects gap by issuing lots and lots of controls. 
and insisting that all the PRs have to be reviewed before they go into main branch, right? Um, and then we have this knowledge gap. So we do we go around getting status updates from everybody. And we ask, where are your JIRA tickets? What is going on with that JIRA ticket, right? Are we, are we red, are we yellow, are we green? And now everybody is running around trying to follow these very detailed instructions while staying within these very tight controls and issuing and issuing lots and lots of status reports instead of meeting the intent. And Stephen Bungay says, the only thing you can do as a leader, if you're working with uncertainty and emergent situations, is clarify your intent and allow people to back brief on you on how they're going to fulfill it. The more you issue these instructions, the more you issue these controls, the more you look for the information, the less people can actually time people can actually spend trying to meet your intent. Right. So clarify your intent, invite them to back brief. And um, if you've ever read um, Turn the Ship Around by David Marquette, he says something pretty similar. Like the whole thing is around clarifying your intent and then people saying, here's what I intend to do based on your intent. And you go, yes, that sounds good. OK, so clarify your intent, back brief. All right. Excuse me a moment. I actually uh, came down with COVID earlier in the month and I still have a little bit of a cough. It's a horrible, horrible illness. I highly recommend avoiding it if you possibly can. Right. So um, this is a Wardley map. So Simon Wardley talks a lot about where we see uncertainty being highest. So the way he, he makes a Wardley map is on the Y axis, he has how visible things are to customers. So he starts with customer needs at the top. And then he looks at the um, the value chain. How do how does things get to meeting the needs of those customers, and what are they dependent on? And he maps it horizontally, so you can think of this as almost like an architecture diagram. But he maps it horizontally um, based on the stability of the components in that value chain. So over on the over on the um, the left hand side we have uh, the genesis stuff um we've got uh in a, we've got this inertia we've got um between each of these phases as well so we start at this genesis idea this is people coming up with random ideas right and they've, they've got no no idea whether it's going to work or not probably you can throw it away there's very little cost and then we go okay so we quite like this idea we've got to get it now into something that actually works so it's not just an idea anymore it's a thing that we're building and from that maybe we start selling that thing we're building or we provide services with it at that point it becomes a stable product now some of those stable products they survive to become commodities, things that are just ubiquitous in our environment. So you can think of electricity. Right? Electricity is a commodity. Power is a commodity. OK, and I'll talk a little bit more about how things become commoditized later as well. But you can see that the higher uncertainty stuff is always going to be over to that left hand side. I think I might be a, a mirror image for you, actually. So I might be pointing to the wrong side, but you've got the slide you can see. OK, so. Um, it's over on that that side uh, with that genesis, that custom built stuff. That's where we have the highest uncertainty. Now, if you're working in software development, that's really interesting because we hardly ever solve problems that we've already solved before. In fact, the third time we solve a problem that we've already solved before, we tend to make open source so we never have to solve it again. It's half of where open source comes from. So we're generally working with high uncertainty emergent situations. Um, it's, it's also worth noting that the movement on the map is also problems we've never solved before. That first time you stabilize something, that first time you turn something into a product, that act of stabilizing things is itself uncertain and emergent. OK. So those of you who know me know the Kinevin framework is one of my favorite, favorite things in the world. I'm going to introduce it really quickly today. I'd much rather have discussions around it than just boringly lecture you on it. Um, so the Kinevin framework is another way of looking at how, how, what kind of situations are we in and how should we behave in those situations. So it describes four main situations. Um, <clears throat> there's one in the middle as well. 
but uh, clear is the first situation we normally come across it. Um, software it used to be called obvious um, and before that it was called simple um, but it's a situation where you you can see what you've got to do it's, it's obvious duh right of course I'd obviously do that um, and we can categorize a problem we go oh it's a one of those I've seen that before okay as things become more and more complicated they require more expertise so a watchmaker knows how to fix watch a car mechanic knows how to fix a car um, and because it's got a known outcome, you can analyze the difference between what you have and what you want. And analysis works quite well, as long as you've got the expertise to do the analysis. OK, the domain we don't like is chaos. Chaos is accident and emergency. It's your house burning down. It's urgent production bugs. In chaos, you have to act and act quickly. It is a transient domain. It's dominated by urgency. Um, if you don't have urgency, you're not in chaos. It's kind of the definition of it. Um, it will resolve itself and not necessarily in your favour. The domain we have the most problem with tends to be the complex one. So you have some time to try things out. It's not like you've got the urgency of chaos, but also nobody's really done it before or they've not done it in that context. And so we have to, to experiment. Um, it's, try things in a way that's safe to fail. It's not quite the same as experiment because experiment tends to have a hypothesis. And what you find in complexity is that when you try things out, you don't just not get what you expected. You get something completely unexpected that you hadn't even thought about. Right. So you get side effects all the time in complexity. So you have to be really careful of thinking about what could go wrong with this and try it at a scale. Um, there's a guy uh, called Polchinski came up with some principles, says fail on a scale where failure is survivable. OK, so we want to make sure it's safe to fail. <clears throat> OK, so what does this look like for most of us in, in business in technology particularly so there's a little innovation cycle i got this from um david anderson the kanban guy he says we start with differentiators things that we're building custom built stuff that nobody else is doing and that makes us different to other companies out there so maybe we're producing the same thing but ours is different to theirs so ours is massive on theirs is twitter right um and we 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 start with these differentiators and then somebody else sees our differentiator and goes, I can spoil that. I can see the fun you're having and I'm going to do it, too. But the, the thing about spoilers is they don't have to go through the experimentation of finding whether there's even a market in the first place. They can see there's a market because they can see that somebody came up with this thing. So they're going to do it, too. So the example I always use with this is the camera phone. Um, so Sharp and Kyocera came up with camera on their phone, uh, early camera phones. You know, let's put a camera on the phone, put it towards the users. So that because they thought users would make video calls, turned out at the time, Internet didn't really support it. Nokia comes along, they spoil the differentiator. They put it on the back of the phone, along with the little mirror so you can take selfies. OK, so they spoil that differentiator. And now, of course, we've mostly all got cameras on our phones. It's become commoditized. And so what you see is as you start getting these cameras on the phones, an ecosystem develops. So we're starting to see things stabilizing over to the left hand side of, of that map, right, of that Wardley map. And um, we start seeing people building stuff on the assumption that there will be a camera on the phone. So you get things like Pokemon Go, um, you get interactive stuff like that. So we built on that ecosystem. And a challenge I often do when I'm coaching on this and I'm doing a workshop on this, I get people to look around the room and see what you can see around the room that's gone through the cycle. It's just about every product that's in your room, that's in your office, that you're looking at around when you look around, it has gone through this. OK. And you can kind of see then how that fits on the Wardley map as well, that it, it starts on that on that um, starts on that left hand side and then gradually moves across. <clears throat> OK, so a uh, little story very quickly. I don't always tell this, but I'm going to today. I talked about unexpected side effects. And there was a company called Ludicor. They had this game called Game Never Ending, wanted people to come play the game. So they made uh, some tools 
in which people could share pictures in the game um, and they thought it would be fun. It never quite worked out. Um, I think there was a re- dot com crash, a recession, something like that. So uh, Stuart Busfield, who was CEO, had to come up with something really fast to make some money out of it. So they repurposed the tools that allowed you to share images and that became Flickr. So he tries it again, got another company. We're going to relaunch this game. This time we're calling it Glitch. Uh, and we come and get people to play the game. And we've got admins behind the scenes and some tools for the admins to talk to, to each other. And once again, the game just doesn't work. It doesn't work. They've actually, there's actually fan clubs out there keep trying to get this game working. Um, but it didn't work for them this time. But they, they need something. They've got to make money somehow. So they repurposed the tools for the admins to talk to each other. That became Slack. And Stuart Busfield, who's the CEO of both Flickr and Slack, said, um, you know, if you want to be successful in business, don't try and create a failed MMO. That's not how this works. It was completely unpredictable. We can see in retrospect how it happened, but we couldn't predict it. So cause and effect and complexity are correlated in retrospect. They're correlated, obviously, when things are clear. They're correlated. Um, <clears throat> they're correlated through expertise uh, when things are complicated. They're not correlated at all in chaos. If you try and work out why the fire started while you're still in the fire, you will probably burn. Um, but they're correlated in retrospect in complexity. So you get unexpected side effects. OK. So just to finish off, Kenevin, um, in clear, clear domain, you get best practices. So there's usually only one way of doing things. So when things have super stabilized, there's only one way of putting a plug into the wall, at least in the UK. Right? There's a plug goes in the wall. There's only really one way of doing it. If you try and do it another way, you're probably going to have a bad time. You know, I've seen horrible things with hairpins and crocodile clips. Don't do that. Um, the complicated domain, because there's, it's not completely stable, there's usually multiple ways of doing it and experts will know which is right for which context. So there's multiple ways of doing things. It's good practice. OK. In complexity, you get emergent practice and emergent outcomes. In chaos, because you've got nothing to lose, you come up with novel practices. I'm not going to tell the stories around those today unless somebody asked me to. The constraints are also really interesting. So in the clear domain, you have these fixed constraints. There's only one way to put a plug into a wall. In the complicated domain, you have governing constraints. Now, these are hard and fast, rule based, context free constraints. Right. So uh, you can think of. Um, We've got one where whenever I, I check my code in, it has to go through the build and the build has to go green before I can merge it. And there's constraints built into that, that whole thing that mean that's uh, that's always the case. Now, if you happen to have an intermittent bug that happens 95 percent of the time, but five percent of the time you manage to get it through the build, you end up in a really interesting place where you can't now get your fixes for that bug into the build because it keeps failing. So that context free nature really holds you back. Right. We need to actually make an escape in that in that context to allow for this this unusual context that we hadn't really considered. So th- there's all kinds of stuff happens when you're actually in an emergent situation. And you've got these complex, these context free rules. OK, so complexity, um, we have these enabling constraints and those are heuristics rather than hard and fast rules. So to give you an example, the army have heuristics, um, go take the high ground, stay in touch. So they have a direction. You can tell whether you're going doing them, going in the right direction with them or not. But you can just choose to do something different when you have to. OK, so they are contextual rather than context free. You can consider your context. Chaos is chaos because it has no effective constraints. So fire keeps burning until it runs out of fuel, runs out of oxygen and meets some constraints. So it's a lack of constraints is what causes chaos. Lack of rules is what allows people to come up with new things. So we have this idea of a shallow dive into chaos where you 
allow people to to come up with like hack days are a good example um you get people to work on their own trying things out and they don't share it until until the end of the day when they come up with their idea and go here's what i came up with right so doing it in private if you can keep the number of people that if you've got like people coming up with these ideas and you want to generate new ideas try and stop them from talking to each other until the ideas are formed a bit because otherwise they all come to consensus on the same set of ideas and you only have average ideas so you want to bring them together once the ideas have formed a bit to harden the ideas to work out whether they're safe to fail etc okay um, so that's the shallow dive into chaos is that lovely. The bottom of that lovely green line is the shallow dive into chaos. There's also a phase shift as well, um, where something you, you kind of know what it is you're aiming for, but there's still some iteration around it. So most of us are actually used to working in that space where you're, you've got a product you're developing, but you've still got some emergence. So it's still complex, just not as complex. OK, in the middle is disorder. Disorder is a domain where we don't know which of these dominates. So we behave according to our preferred domain. Actually, it's been renamed to confuse. So they all start with C now. But it's it's one where you go applying the wrong approach to the domain. So you're pretending something is predictable when it really, really isn't. Or you're trying something out when it's not safe to fail. So I was having a conversation around experimentation and, and probing and trying things out with somebody who said, um, how do you apply this to my job, which is decommissioning nuclear power plants? I said, I don't know, because if we have an explosion in the code base, I just roll it back to the previous version. Right. So software is inherently safe to fail in a way that hardware and buildings are simply not. And it's one of the reasons why tech is changing so fast, because we can try things out in a way that's safe to fail in our code bases, on our home laptops, in our builds. And if it don't, goes wrong, we just don't have to release that. Yeah, so it's got an inherent safety to fail. It's, it's why it moves so fast. It's also why the best tech companies, the most successful tech companies are the ones that are moving fast because they can solve problems the quickest. OK, so this gives us a real problem when it comes to planning things and decision making. Because we really like certainty. We really like making plans and, and having people stick to those plans. So we start this project, we start this effort. And at the start, we have very limited information. <clears throat> and the first thing we do is we go, OK, so we reckon this will take about two years. I need a detailed breakdown of that. And I'm going to put a deadline in place for this date. Or we're going to make some marketing materials with some big promises about what you'll have by Christmas. OK, so that Christmas is a deadline. The other kind where people put a line in the sand and go, we think it will be ready then. I call that a sad line. No opportunity is going to die. But if you don't make it, somebody somewhere will be sad. OK, people tend to be very pragmatic around real deadlines in a way that they're simply not around sad lines. So what usually happens with sad lines particularly is that somebody makes a whole bunch of decisions at this point. And then as the project continues and you start making the discoveries when you start bringing everything together and you start really getting it into a product shape, that's when you make discover most of the information right at the end. That's when you do all the really hard things. And especially if you're working with uh, companies that value predictability like that, because the really hard stuff is unpredictable, it's emergent, it's the stuff that's most important that nobody's ever done before. That's where all the discoveries end up being. So everybody focuses on the really early stuff, the really easy stuff that they know how that's going to work. And what I see is people just pushing back on all the rest. No, we need more analysis. Analysis doesn't work when it's emergent. And I'll talk through again some other tools for spotting it and what you do when you've got this emergent stuff. OK, so here's my little tool for really for quickly working out where are we in terms of emergent or known stuff. So who in the world's ever done this before? Five. Nobody in the world's ever done it before. It's about as complex as it possibly could be. Four. Somebody's done it, but not here, not in our organisation or not in our context. 
So we know it can be done, but we don't know whether we can do it. We don't know what they repurposed. So um, repurposing is called acceptation in complex space. The reuse of something for purposes that it wasn't originally intended for, like um, fl Flickr and Slack, you know, being repurposing tools from a game. Um, <clears throat> we don't know what they managed to exact to get that stuff working. So we don't know whether we can do it. It's still going to be complex. Um, three, somebody in our organization has done it before or they've done it in a similar, similar context or we can go learn it from a book. We can learn it from YouTube. We can gain that expertise. Two, somebody in our team has done it before and one, we all know how to do it. The fives and fours are always emergent. And because in software development and technology, we're always trying to solve problems that nobody's ever solved before. We've always got one of those that's driving the effort. And people have said to me, well, we don't have one of those. I'm like, Why are you doing that project then? Why aren't you just reusing what you did before? Oh, well, the previous one didn't work because and we'd, so we're redoing it. But with this extra thing, like, there you go. There's your five and four right there. That's what's driving it. Right. So what's different? about what you did before. Why are you doing it again if you've already got it? Ah, well, we want it, but we want it to work with this new technology. Right, there you go. There's your five and four. So everything always has a five and four. Even the act of stabilizing something into a product is a five or four, right? Automating something for the first time, building the factory that's going to build that new car is also complex. So really easy way to work out where you are. So what do you do if you're in that complex state? You've got to do something that's safe to fail. So in technology terms, proof of concept, um, a spike, uh, an alpha, get something out that's safe to fail. I've actually got a little blog post where I break down what I think of as an alpha or a beta, and it's about who you're giving it to, who who's putting their efforts into that thing. And we'll talk a little bit about um, early adopters later in this talk as well. All right, so here's what they look like roughly on the Kinevin diagram. You've got your fives and fours, they're complex. You've got your threes, they're the perfect domain for expertise. Twos and ones we're not worried about. Twos and ones, you're probably gonna be using something off the shelf, right? That's the easy stuff. Probably gonna be using something open source. The fives and fours are where the problem really starts. So do those first. Work out what, what are we most worried about? What do we know least about? Get that stuff done very early on. Try it out. It's actually easy to stub the twos because the contacts are really stable rates. Right? So you just pretend that you, you make mocks of them, you make fakes of them. You find ways to experiment with those fives and fours early on while you've still got time to react and it's safe to fail. OK, so that is the Kinevin diagram. We talked earlier about the constraints. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about those just because now you've seen them and you're starting to understand what happens when you put the wrong constraints on the wrong thing. Right? It breaks chaotically. You're in disorder. So when disorder persists, you're in confusion. When confusion persists, it causes chaos. OK. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how those constraints apply uh, to maps as well. I want to give one more little story, which is um, about side effects. Side effects aren't always a bad thing. So I was working with this little company, uh, just went in to visit them for a day. Super agile company. I wanted to see how they worked. And they had this graph on the wall and it had numbers in hundreds up the sides and dates along the bottom in months. Um, and I said, oh, is that your bug count? They said, good guess. Um, yeah, that's our bug count. I said, what on earth happened? It's a really interesting graph. This thing was framed, right? And they said, ah, so um, you'll never guess. I said, well, I can see the bugs went up. They said, yep. Yeah. They said, um, that's the point at which we hired, an hired another dev into the team and then started rotating one member of the team on a bug fixing role. So that's why they started going to because we've got one person always bug fixing. And then at the bottom, we thought that was working so well, we would do it more. So he hires another dev and got another dev, experienced dev bug fixing. I went, oh, well, the new dev's no good. Now, bear in mind, I've never met these poor people before, right? And I've just done the pattern match. 
my brain is like, well, it must be the people. You hired the people there, and then there were more bugs. So it must be the people. OK. And I went, nope. I said, oh, did the team get complacent? So now I'm using my history. I'm using that that belief, that ladder of influence, come up with what I think are reasonable, reasonable suppositions. So I'm judging this team, this poor team with all these new bugs coming in. You know, I'm, I'm making judgments about them. I'm like, oh, did this this team no good? Um, did they get complacent? No, it wasn't that. Well, maybe what was what they were trying to do harder? No, not at all. I said, well, where were the bugs coming from? They said, ah, the users had spotted that they that we were fixing them and started reporting them. They were already there, but we didn't know. So these side effects that you get can be good things. Like it's good to know where the bugs are, but it looks bad. It looks bad. The indicator that you were expecting that the bug count would go down went completely the opposite way. And we see these side effects all the time. There's a thing called the Cobra effect where um, they asked the, the people of Delhi uh, to bring them dead cobras. And if you brought a dead cobra, you got paid um, because that was how they thought they would make less cobras. And of course, the enterprising people of Delhi started bringing the cobras uh, to get more money. And then, of course, they worked out that was happening so they withdrew the bounties and the people just let the cobras go so there were more cobras so it can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing you have to treat indicators in uncertainty with real curiosity because the constraints the context will not make it go the way that you think okay <laughs> so um what's in mapping you can see things stabilize you've got the complexity over on that left hand side um over on the right hand side, things become stable. There's inertia. That's the kind of gap between each of those phases. Getting it into that stable state is also complex. And the constraints increase as they go in that direction. Right. Um, by the time you get it to be product, it needs to be predictable. It needs to be stable. The constraints need to be such that it doesn't do the wrong thing. By the time you become a power company, you have to be super stable. And there's so many safety nets in place to stop the power from going wrong, stop people from being electrocuted, stop um, having too much electricity in the grid. Yeah, so there's all kinds of safety nets. OK, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask any questions at this stage before I move on to the next bit. Pop them in the chat if you have got some. I'm just taking a quick drink. This uh, COVID is not nice. OK, not yet, not as far as I can see. So <clears throat> I want to introduce you to another of my favourite little models that I came across. This was from Julian Birkenshaw. He's a, a professor at London School of Economics. Um, he has a book all about adhocracy. I think it might be called Fast Forward, if I remember correctly. Um, but it's all about this thing called ad hocracy. So he talks about how organisations are organised. So when labour and um, labour and production are the scarce resource, you've got people in factories working to produce more. You need more people. Uh, and this is where bureaucracy comes in. So you are privileged by your position in the organisation. The higher up in the organisation you are, the more privilege you have. Um, you're governed by rules. Here are where the things go and you must put this onto the onto the circuit board and then off goes the circuit board to the next person. Um, it's organized by hierarchy. And you're motivated by exchange rewards. The more you get paid, the faster you go. Right. That's it. So when you start getting into a meritocracy, this is really interesting. Um, it, meritocracy is when labour and production have stopped being the scarce resource. So we've managed to automate it away. But now the knowledge needed to run those systems, to come up with new things, that's what we need. That's that knowledge and expertise. And we, uh, we're governed by mutual adjustments. So we decide what, what, what are we going to aim for next? What are we going to give up? What are we going to try? Right? And ideally, we make decisions through logical arguments instead of our hierarchy. 
Um, and we're, we're motivated by mastery of our skills. Um, if you've ever seen Dan Pink's talk, Drive, he talks about autonomy, mastery and purpose, right? So autonomy is that here is my intent and you go, here is how I'm going to meet it. I have autonomy about how I meet that, how I meet that, that intent that you're talking about. Um, the clarity of the intent gives me purpose, so autonomy and purpose. And then my skill to meet that intent is the thing I am mastering. Um, again, I'm going to give a bit of a shout out for Turn the Ship Around. Very small book. Wish I had read it long before I did. <clears throat> OK. So the really, really interesting thing happens when you start finding that knowledge and experience are no longer the scarce resource. So Jeff Gothelf, who's a UX guy, talks about um, he talks about having data on tap. Right, so you can see the impact of what you're doing and try things out really cheaply. And then you move into this thing called an ad hocracy. So the people who are prepared to act and have conviction, they're the scarce resource, the entrepreneurs. And you are governed by the opportunities available to you in the marketplace. Um, you make decisions through experimentation and you're motivated by achievement. So I was looking at the agile fluency model and zone four in that is this this state that you move into where you you can you, you're making differences in the market and you're changing the way the market works. Right. <clears throat> and uh, Diana said uh, when I was talking to her about it, she said, uh, Diana Larson, she said, it's a bit of a red herring. Nobody really stays in state four. And I think it's actually because that genesis phase is chaos. It's not dominated by constraints. So it inevitably resolves itself. Somebody comes along, spoils your differentiator, and now you're back in that we need to have knowledge and experience again. So it's a transient thing that happens. So what you're looking for, if you want that feeling in your organization of being in a startup, of, of having that, that urgency, is not being in it all the time. It's being able to move into it when an opportunity arises. And you can still be a stable product company and do that. Really interesting. OK, <clears throat> so I said I was going to talk a little bit about early adopters and innovators and, and the difference between them. Um, I got this model. Uh, I, I read Crossing Chasm a while ago, but I got this this little bit of it from um, Chris Matz. So I'll talk about Chris and what he saw in this uh, as well. Um, so the idea is that when you start coming up with something, you've got these innovators and these innovators are going to take this this thing on that you gave them. And it's a bit new and it's a bit buggy. And the, then the early adopters come along. They see it. They're like, oh, that looks interesting. Maybe I'll try it, too. And then there's a chasm. Between them and the early majority. And the early majority, they don't want buggy things. They want stable products. Right. And then the late majority come along and they want something super stable that, you know, they actually that's been out for a very long time and it's been quite stable already. And then you get the laggards who who they're like, you know, what's a color TV? OK, so this curve of adoption is there. And if you notice that little chasm. That's inertia, that's inertia on Simon Wardley's map. That's the gap. I've actually got a whole talk where I draw, redraw his map, but with big gaps and mountain ranges and things saying here be dragons, because that that is the work getting across that gap through those phases. That is the work. Right. That is where the uncertainty is. OK, <clears throat> so Chris Matz noticed this um, this thing with the agile community and we're at Lean Agile Global, so we can look at what it comes from. Right. So. The innovators and early adopters, they have needs and they're willing to work with you to have you meet their needs. So we need to deliver software better. This is where the Agile Manifesto originally came from. It's this community that just they want to do something and they'll work with you to tweak it. They'll work with you to tweak Scrum. They'll work with you to tweak XP and screen programming. And they want to deliver software better. And there isn't a one size fits all solution. It's it's applicable to a context. So they tend to be smaller companies as well. But now we've jumped that gap 
and the people on the other side of that gap, they don't want to have to fit it to their context. They just want it to work. And this is where we're seeing the big frameworks, the modern version of Scrum, scaled agile framework, just and people are buying it because they just want it to land. But you're dealing with human systems. And human systems are always emergent. The transformation of human systems is always emergent. And so when you apply these big frameworks as a whole to different contexts, you end up with these governing constraints around these emergent systems. And you, everybody must do Scrum, everybody must do two weeks, but everybody must use Jira, everybody must put their things in in story points. And suddenly people, the teams are breaking because it doesn't fit their context. All of the stuff in the body of Agile, they're good ideas. They're things to try out. And sure, you can have an ideal in mind, but the journey you take might be very different to where you actually end up getting to. So Chris spotted that there was this community of needs and conferences around this community of needs. He brought up Lean Agile Scotland. I think Lean Agile London and Lean Agile Global are part of this same, you know, we, we are all wanting to do things better, not just go agile, right? There's, that's the community of solutions. So I tend to prefer those little niche conferences to the great big huge ones, because the little ones are where the interesting work is happening. Okay. <clears throat> so Chris, uh, is a good friend, Dan, another of my friends, both came up with the these sets of rules that help us navigate uncertainty. So I want to introduce these tools to you as well. They're related to everything I've been talking about. So Dan comes at, came up with this thing called deliberate discovery. He says, so first of all, three rules. First of all, you assume ignorance. There's stuff you don't know about and you have no expertise in. Secondly, assume second order ignorance. You don't know what you don't know. But you do know where you don't know it. It's going to be in the new. It's going to be in the stuff you know least about. You don't know what you don't know about it, but you know it's going to be there, right? So that's my take on this. Um, so it says, assume second order ignorance and optimize for discovery. Do the stuff you know least first. Embrace that risk early on. While it's still safe to fail, de-risk it. OK. And Chris has this, this thing called real options um, that's also related. And he's got three rules as well, because we like things in threes. So he says, first of all, options have value. So an option in finance is the right, but not the obligation to buy something or to sell something. Um, in real life, it's harder to value things, but we do know that they have value. So having choices in your life has value. OK, options expire. At some point, you have to make a choice or one will get made for you. Never commit early unless you know why. So um, this it's not just about not committing early. So we have this idea in Agile, of the last responsible moment, the point at which you should reasonably make a decision, but not making decisions early. So don't make those promises, those marketing materials early if you can avoid doing so. Um, how long does it take to make the marketing materials? When do you actually need to know what we're going to produce? It's another way of doing it, right? So you can buy yourself options. And it does cost a little bit to get those options, but sometimes it's worth doing when you're in uncertainty and you don't really know what's going to emerge. So I'll give you my absolute favorite example of this. Um, I can give you some tech ones later if you want me to, but and this this is so deeply personal to me. So my partner, um, we've been together for some years and he said, I'd like you to move in with me. Let's move in together. Let's buy a house together. I said, it might not work. I've, I've lived with people before and it never works. I am a massive introvert and I so have to have my own space. And just every time I've moved in with somebody and we tried to live together, it's ended up breaking the relationship. And I really value this relationship and I don't want to lose it. So I don't think this is a good idea at all. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not the same as all the other people you've lived with. And I reckon it will work, but let's try it out as an experiment. I went, 
all right, we can do that. How does this work? So we gave it a year. We said, let's move in together for a year. And if it doesn't work, we'll just move out again and we'll get our own places again. And we'll keep whatever we need to make that happen. And after about a year and a half, the people who um, owned the townhouse that we were living in, they wanted it back. So uh, we had to move out. We had to explain to the movers why we had two pianos and two TVs and two of, two of this and two of that. Uh, but it did. We, we ended up doing another experiment after that because the townhouse was a lovely big place. We ended up doing an experiment called how small a place can we live in? And that did not work at all. That was a that was a totally failed experiment. Right. But it was safe to fail because we were still only renting. And now having tried it out, we now know what we need. And so we've actually bought this place that I'm sitting in right now. And we bought it in the middle of the pandemic. And I'm so glad we have it because having your own space is really nice. And it's a little bit too small, but it's working OK. I think having that constraint of being a little bit too small is, is good because otherwise there would always be chaos and we would always fill the space for right? chaos. We're chaos. It keeps happening until it runs into constraints. So there you go. Buying options, thinking about how can we experiment with this? Can, can we try something? Can we rent something? Can we um, Chris talks about um, if you don't know which technology to go with, uh, go with the one that's easy to change or try them both until it's which one is right emerges. So that's concurrent set based engineering, right? Going in two different directions at the same time and then bringing your findings back. Um, that shallow dive into chaos. OK, this all buys you options. OK. So the other thing I do as a coach is I go, OK, so where do you make these commitments? Where do you put constraints in place that you then can't change direction because they just apply for the whole of the rest of the year? Because commitments are constraints. OK, so you might have a yearly budgeting cycle. You could have a quarterly rolling budgeting cycle instead. You could do that um, and that would allow you to change direction more often. A quarter of a year is less of a commitment than a full year. Um, your regulatory requirements are a constraint and committing to meeting them is a constraint. You can actually talk to the regulators and go, hey, look, this thing is feeling really onerous. We think this meets the spirit of what you're intending. Would that work? And regulators are actually often very open to that feedback, especially if the rule is a new one. Um, upfront analysis work, you do lightweight planning. I've got a whole blog post called Capability Based Analysis and Lightweight Planning that's all based on that 54321 and takes a few post its really lightweight. And you can throw the post its away because they're not a big commitment. Work done but not in use, that is work that you have committed, you've put your energy into already, it's gone, you've lost it, but you're not using it and it might be the wrong work, you don't know. You won't know until it gets out there. So getting small things out rather than big things, um, small frequent changes <clears throat> and that high cost of making things ready for use, that big upswing at the end of that graph I showed. If you can do the really crazy stuff, the really hard stuff, the really the things you know least about, do them early, get them as ready for use in a small way and then you'll actually avoid that high cost at the end and you'll be able to get that work out. And if you do it in smaller pieces, you have a great engineering culture, a culture of continuous deployment and change. If you can get there, that's agile. And you don't have to get there all at once. OK. So it's not about going agile. It's not about meeting some outcome. It's about looking at your context and going, OK, in our context, what's the change that we might do next? So you might find you've got this landscape of context. And I go to some places, I go, let's do BDD. And they go, our testers come from um, a, a test has come from an agency and we pay them by the number of bugs they find. Like, OK, what can we change about that to make the context better? Let's not worry about doing BDD because BDD doesn't feel like a good fit for this context. You know, let's let's be the for those who don't know, it's talking through examples in conversation so you don't make the bugs in the first place. Testers who are paid for finding bugs have no incentive to get involved in those conversations whatsoever. It's just not a good fit for them. But maybe we could change the contract. 
maybe we could um, incentivize them to help the devs five get have fewer bugs. Maybe we can um, I know, ask the devs uh, how to to get involved in some way that's better. You know, maybe we could ask the devs to do some initial testing so we pay the QAs less. There might be changes we can make that aren't that outcome. So we're always looking for the adjacent possibles. Dave Snowden keeps talking about Frozen 2. There's a song in it called Do the Next Right Thing. Um, I, I actually listened to this this afternoon for the first time. It's a very beautiful song. She's very sad. She's lost all hope. She can't keep going, but she has to keep going on. So do the next right thing, even if you've lost all hope. One important thing that Dave said is you don't need agreement of understanding because you can't get it in complexity because everybody thinks there's different contexts going on to have agreement of action. You can choose to do something and try things out because you both think it's a useful thing to do. Um, I'm having a lot of climate related discussions right now. There's a whole load of vegans who think meat is murder. I think meat is a natural thing for human beings to eat. But we both agreed that we need to be eating more plants because it's better for the environment. They think that we should be eating more plants anyway. I'm like, we can both agree that we should just be eating more plants. That's really important to me because those of you who know me know I always finish with something like this. Um, today's CO2 levels are 417.02, which is up on last year by 0.5%. They are going up and we need them to be going down. So if you can do the next right thing, work out what that is for you, go do it, please. Um, little plug, I will be leaving my current client uh, at the end of this year beginning of next year, I will be looking for work. I'm actually back in development again. So I'm back being a Kotlin dev. I'm open to other languages. I am particularly looking for eco related work. And uh, I am willing to go permanent with the right company. So if you have contacts and put me in touch, please do. Thank you very much. <laughs>